So to give you a little background of what's happening with the Da Vinci Institute right now, um, we're an organization that started in 1997. And we've been in this location since 2003. Um, the, the bank that we're in right now has been sold and so uh, we, have, we have to relocate uh, to a new facility by the end of July. And so we're in the process of looking for new facilities and so this whole idea of, uh, maybe not quite that loud, uh, uh, as we're looking around at what all else is going on in the area, um, I came up with this idea of maker districts and it ties in with so many of the trends that are happening around the world right now. So when was the last time you had a truly memorable shopping experience? Um, I asked myself that question earlier today and I was, I was having a hard time with it. Uh, actually, we, we did have a good shopping experience over the weekend, but that was, that was an anomaly. It wasn't the norm. Usually it's uh, kind of a lot of drudgery going around to the stores. How many of you have been to the source on Brighton Road in the Rhino District, north of Denver? Um, this is one of Mickey Zeppelin's uh, projects. He took this old, I, I think it was this old steel mill, and turned it into a real interesting kind of artisan shop mix there. There's a brewery there, there's a couple restaurants, uh, a few other stores. They've thrown in little co-working with it, and they've created this real interesting kind of destination in a place that is not known for having good stuff around there. Um, there's, there's some real interesting trends coming to, uh, uh, together right now. And uh, I'll, I'll just go through some of the trends that are happening. The, the shopping mall is essentially dead in the United States. Um, it, it had uh, a 50 year run, but we've not built any new shopping malls in the United States since 2006. Um, now the mall is, was kind of an interesting breed of animal, but it had this problem that when one or two of the anchors would fold, it would kind of create a cancer that would start eating away at the rest of the, uh, the, uh, the whole organization, and it would start tearing it down. So then the cities were, tent were left as the backstop to deal with all of the problems um, that were left. Cities end up being the backstop for all kinds of problems, if you have a failed golf course, if you have a failed um, uh, industrial park, or uh, they, they end up having to deal with all kinds of things that they're not really equipped to deal with. 1962 was the birth of the big box retail boom. Um, the first Walmart, the first Kmart, and the first Target stores started in 1962. Um, there must have been something in the water that year. Everybody says, hey, let's start uh, a new retail uh, mega industry, and that's what they did. The birth of online retail started in 94. That was with Amazon. Amazon was really the first big player in that space. Then eBay started in 95. Apple had their online presence officially in 97. Alibaba started in 99. Um, Walmart and Staples came right after that. Now, the top five retailers, online, online retailers in, in the United States are all of them except eBay. eBay is not in the top five anymore. There's plans for closing 6,000 stores in the very near future here. Um, this headline showed up uh, just a, a few days ago and I was, I was kind of struck by it. 6,000 stores closing. This all has to do with the online world. When the online world picks up speed, uh, even eating away as much as 5% of the business, in a lot of cases, that's all the profit uh, for these, these, on, these uh, bricks and mortar stores. So out of that 6,000, Radio Shack has a big chunk of those a lot of Office Depot, Office Max, Walgreens. 
Um, Build-A-Bear's wet seal, his clothing. Um, Deb Shops. I don't know, are you familiar with Deb Shops? Deb, are you familiar with Deb Shops? <laughs> uh, that, that voice in the corner over there, that's my wife, Deb. So, uh, Dollar Tree, uh, Family Dollar, a lot of those closing. Future Shop in Canada is essentially the same as uh, Best Buy uh, down here. A few J.C. Penney stores, 77 Sears are closing, 55 Staples. This is a whole lot of stores closing. Um, is this going to create a looming tax crisis, sales tax crisis? Um, I think so. Uh, we still haven't figured out how to properly tax online businesses. Um, the, the companies, the businesses that are, have been loyal parts of every community out here, the ones that have been supporting it with their employees working in the area, the, they're at a significant disadvantage by uh, having to charge sales tax where the, the online companies basically do not. Uh, a few projections here. This is the growth of the online retail industry forecasts. 327 billion by next year. This is a kind of an interesting chart here. This shows the difference in impulse buying. If you're buying something online, the chances of making an impulse purchase are way less than if you're in a, an actual store. I always, I always think of that walking out to the checkout line and there's that one lone Snickers bar that somehow wiggled its way to the front of the shelf. And it's, it, it kind of has your name written all over it. So, <laughs> so there's inside of this whole retail category, there's this uh, uh, peer offline, peer online. And then in the middle, it's the people that are doing research online and then go to the store and actually make a purchase. Um, there's actually quite a bit of growth in that area. Retail is not going to go away. We're not consuming less. In the United States, we all still own too darn much stuff. Um, so retail is, is here to stay, but how we sell things and the, the type of stores we're going to visit is going to change dramatically. In 2005, Make Magazine uh, first started, pu published its first edition. That's 10 years ago. Make Magazine is uh, the kind of at the corner of the maker industry. So people who like to work with their hands. Um, this is in response to, we've had this kind of massive brain drain. Um, all the excitement was happening in the digital world. So we were taking people out of the physical world into the digital world. Uh, and so we have this whole generation of people who don't really know how to work with their hands. Um, Make Magazine was kind of in response to that, that pendulum swinging back the other way. And so now we're starting to see a lot more people interested in doing things with their hands again. Uh, this whole maker space, maker hacker space um, industry kind of got started with Tech Shop in San Francisco in 2006. And a few others started showing up. Heat sink labs in Mesa, Arizona. This is just uh, a few token ones. The one I like best is Tinker Mill in Longmont that's close by. We have some representatives here from Longmont. This is uh, uh, some scenes from Tech Shop. Um, the memberships are typically a little less than $100, 80 to $100, some, something like that. And if you come across a machine you don't know how to use it, generally it'll teach you how to use it. Um, if you've played around with Square, if you know what Square is, Square is the uh, thing that you swipe credit cards on, you hook it onto your smartphone, uh, swipe your credit cards on it. That was the first prototype was actually created at the tech shop in San Francisco. Um, so that's little claim to fame that they have. Um, this is the Artisans Asylum, Somerville, Massachusetts. Um, they also do a lot of training there. Heat Sink Labs, Mesa, Arizona. 
Um, these are just fun places to hang out at. Uh, this is the one in Austin, Texas, the ATX hackerspace. Uh, lots of good stuff going on. And this is uh, some shots from Tinker Mill up in Longmont. Um, I wanted to put that one shot of Steve Elliott making swords, but I, I couldn't find that photo. It wasn't handy enough. Uh, we, had a, we had a film crew here from uh, South Korea, uh, uh, a KBS film crew, and they were filming Innovation in Colorado. We took them up to Tinker Mill in Longmont, and, and Steve was out back um, making swords over the open flame, and that was, that was quite a, a fascinating demonstration there. So the maker district defined, it's, it's a little hard to define. So I, I use, I phrase it this way. It can best be described as a cross between an artist colony, a farmer's market, woodworking shop, music festival, bakery, brew pub, and brainstorming session all happening in the same space. Uh, it's kind of that and, and much more. So what, what would a maker's district look like? So with all of the empty spaces that we have around, we have lots of big box retail stores that are sitting empty. Uh, we have a Sam's Club here in Louisville that's been empty for what, six or seven years, something like that now. Uh, there's a church that has temporarily moved in there. Um, there's, there's the examples of empty big box stores all over the place. And so I was thinking this would be kind of an interesting way to fill in these empty spaces. So if you think about the idea of all of the products that are being sold in this maker's district actually being made there, uh, and whether it's consumable things like bread or whether it's things like pottery, or they're making uh, durable things that don't have to be sold instantly, uh, could be jewelry making, um, lots of different forms of jewelry making that happen. Um, or it could be making furniture, working with wood, uh, working with saws, uh, the, the craftsmen that are making shoes. Um, most restaurants are making their own food and everything, so restaurants would naturally fit in here along with brew pubs and distilleries, that sort of thing. Uh, this is a, a cheese maker, they're making cheese guitar maker. Uh, I love this idea of making musical instruments. Um, the thing that I find so compelling about this idea of the maker's district is that you, when you go into these shops, there's a new story that goes along with uh, every experience there. You get to meet the craftsmen, you get to meet the owners, you get to talk to them directly. Um, and and then every visit you would have to something like this would be a different kind of experience. It could be traditional artists, whether they're doing things like oil painting, uh, other types of graphics. Um, this guy is working with a lot of leather. Um, lady making dresses, could be fashion designers. Last, uh, a year and a half ago, we, Deb and I were in uh, Rosewood, West Virginia. And we ran into this, this guy, Mick Wright, and he makes shoes, uh, very colorful shoes. And everyone's a one-off, everything's different. Uh, and so his shoes sell for oh, around $250 a pair, and they're very well made. Uh, and so each new pair is whatever inspires him at that moment. Uh, quite a colorful character. Uh, this is a, in a distillery. No, I take it back. This is a brewery. They're actually, uh, no, this is a distillery that they're making kegs of whatever. Um, there can be chefs that are uh, making one-of-a-kind meals or making um, condiments or whatever they're wanting to sell. This is a, a distillery here where they're, uh, some of the latest state-of-the-art equipment. Um, 
If you've never gone on a distillery tour, we actually have quite a few in Colorado here, whether it's Stranahan's or there's three, uh, Roundhouse Distillery in, in uh, Boulder. There's uh, 303 Distillery in Boulder. There, in Longmont, there is uh, a rum distillery. I think it's up in Frederick, there's a, a cidery making hard cider. But the, the artists find their own community. They find who their audience is. They make things. This guy could be making things for Hollywood. Or this one here. Um, I need somebody to rework me. So <laughs> I, had, I had heard uh, a few days ago that Disney had figured out a way to 3D print hair. And this really caught my attention because I need more hair. And, and then I, I found out that really what they had figured out how to do is, is to 3D print more lifelike hair on dolls. So that was not the same thing. So I'm still waiting on that one. <coughs> Bread makers, fudge makers, uh, making light dresses. This, this is a gentleman that's figured out how to use 3D printers to make, uh, make art. I uh, found that quite fascinating. There's, um, 3D printing is going to be used for sculptures and lots of other artwork. If you think about the statue of David that Michelangelo created, it took him four years to carve that out of solid marble. Right now we can scan that and 3D print a replica of that. Uh, in, in some pretty durable material in just a day or two. Um, so that's, that's kind of the, the world we're entering into. And they're using 3D printing in combination with other forms of art too. So um, they're getting very creative. So what does a maker shop look like in your mind? How could that be morphed into something more? So some of the possibilities are, you know, restaurants, cookie shops, uh, candy shops, ice cream, pretzels, bread making, donuts, sweet rolls, meat markets, fudge shops, custom, customized health food. Now, the reason I'm going through this is because I want to open this up into a conversation here because I think this, uh, the real ideas are out in the minds of everybody here in the audience. Uh, coffee roasters, tea cutters, uh, people that are making energy drinks, uh, brewing energy drinks, cideries, distilleries. Uh, and because we're in the center of the marijuana, marijuana revolution, uh, there's lots of new options that can come out of the woodwork if we, uh, if we want them to. But we can do one-of-a-kind furniture, uh, artisan clocks, jewelry, clothing, Custom-made shoes, musical instruments, handbags, sculptures, painting, pottery, weaving. So art, design, and beauty are always changing. Consumer interests and tastes are always changing. And maker districts must also be constantly changing. This is a, a very fluid environment. All of the, uh, the retail world is very fluid. It hasn't been thought of it that way in the past, but it needs to be thought of that way in the future. So if we think about reinventing the shopping experience, it's not just about going and finding a product on the shelf. When people go shopping, they're shopping for surprises. They're looking for something that's new and different, something that'll catch their attention. Sometimes it might be as minor as, oh, I didn't know I could get it in that price, or I didn't know I could get it in that color. But more so, they're looking for, wow, I never knew that existed. Uh, this is very cool, the way this one works. And if we tie in the retail experience with, uh, in the end, this becomes a gathering place. This becomes a place where people can meet other people. Uh, and if we also learn how to make things, if we learn, learn how to learn new experiences, that's all the better. So we can hold events in a maker district. Um, so in your mind, what would be a good type of an event to hold in a maker district? 
Is it something for kids? Is it something for adults? Is it an evening uh, wine tasting party? Uh, will there be live music there? Should there be co-working? Should this be a place where people can go hang out and, uh, and just do their work during the day? We have lots of people in Colorado that are working from home right now, and they would much rather be hanging out with like-minded people. And so these co-working spaces, um, the ones that are in interesting environments, they're the ones catching people's attention. So what would the ideal co-working situation look like? Doing training. Um, if you could go to a shop and learn how to make gadgets or make fudge or make cookies, you're learning how to do the craft that they're doing. Would they be willing to teach you how to um, run your own distillery? What would that look like? Um, this looks like fun, doesn't it? This is actually the Chicago School of Guitar Making. I thought that was so interesting because I had no idea that they had a school there teaching people how to make guitars. There are very few of these schools in the world. <laughs> Um, then we played around, uh, we, we've had some brainstorming sessions on this. We played around this idea that um, the artisan shops, uh, typically mom and pop businesses are not really good entrepreneurs. And so maybe we need some anchor tenants to actually uh, kind of shore up the, the bottom line. Does that make sense? Would it make sense to have um, Budweiser, Coors, or New Belgium set up a, a mini bottling plant? right there in the makerspace. You can, you can test out the beer right there and watch it being made. Um, this is, would it make sense to have Hershey's set up a, a Hershey's Kiss manufacturing line? Um, put the little silver foil around it, hand it to you right there, and tell the Hershey's story at the same time. Maybe Frito-Lay should have their own potato chip or some new snack chip or some Something maybe healthier than potato chips. Uh, Kellogg's. Should we make breakfast cereal? Could we have a little mini factory there where they're making new kinds of breakfast cereal and testing them out on you? Would that be fun? I think that'd be fun. That'd be a blast. Um, or we could have somebody manufacturing energy drinks right there on the spot. You could try them out and then you'd be set for the rest of the day because you'd be so energized. <laughs> so I, I'd like to open this up for a discussion here, but uh, asking these questions here. What are the core ingredients for creating the ultimate makerspace district, um, that type of experience, and what's the optimal number of storefronts that you would need? I think if you have too few, then you don't have uh, kind of enough of an experience. Too many is too hard to manage. Um, and what kind of shops or experience would keep you coming back? So I, I know that there's different ways of looking at this that we haven't talked about. And uh, I, would, I would love to, to hear from all of you. So uh, with that. The Renaissance Fair meets Star Trek. <laughs> experience is the key. Yeah. Uh, people shop online because they don't want to go to a boring box where the people that are there don't really want to be there. Yeah. So experience the key. People will walk in the sun and dehydrate nearly to death to go to the Renaissance Fair because people are happy to be there. They're interested. They're there because they want to. And that draws the people into the experience. OK. All right, good. Somebody else have want to weigh in on this? Um, Steve, can we turn this down a little bit? Don't know it's interesting. Man. I think only in Colorado is this actually something that's going to start. It's going to be difficult in a lot of other states, but I could definitely see something like this happening. In um, Boulder, if you know where the Savers was, it's closing, it, it closed down, it was kind of a mystery, no one knows why. Turns out, uh, I recently heard that some company bought the entire place, kicked out all the companies to put in their own makers district restaurants only. Okay. So what they're doing now is basically there's nothing in South Boulder. There's very little in South Boulder. So this company, from what I've heard, is coming in there and it's literally everything in that whole entire complex in South Boulder that isn't food 
is getting turned into food. If you have a business there, your, 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 your lease is getting expired and you have to become a restaurant. And the whole entire savers area is going to be like a, a food court, more or less. And um, it may work, it may not. I think that obviously they've hit on something because there isn't a lot of places to eat in South Boulder, so that's a good mix. And I think as far as people coming back, you, it, it seems like whenever we look at any place like this, it's you know, even at the, the at the, the markets that we go to, the Saturday market and stuff, it's huge lines of food, and then everyone else has kind of got something kind of going on. So, I mean, I think there is as far as it's going to be a mix of food, breweries, distilleries, things that people can consume. If that's 50 to 60 percent, maybe I don't know what the right ratio is, and then you have your creative space around that. But it sounds like you know that's something that's going to get people coming back time and time again. Yeah, the, the one thing in my mind that would be a driver for this is the fact that you have an empty big box store and it takes forever for uh, retailers or some combination of retailers to come in there and fill that space. The people that own the building are, are, are dying on the vine there. They're having to spend a lot of money just to pay for the, uh, uh, the taxes or they might have some underlying mortgages or notes on it this might be a quicker way to fill in those spaces. Um, so also, if you have a project that you're working on right now, fill us in on that. Um, Steve, do you want to fill us in on what you're working on? Um, in introduce yourself first. Okay, well, my name is Steve Elliott. My co-conspirators are <laughs> Marta and Nino here. And uh, we're putting together a Latino marketplace in North Longmont. And uh, think of it as Chinatown, Little Italy, that sort of thing. We want to make a destination place that people want to come. But as you say, we want people to keep coming back. Yeah. So we're here to see uh, what ideas we can pick up about, what kind of interactive things we can do that would keep people coming back. As you were talking, I was thinking about one thing that I had stumbled across a few years ago that I'm surprised there aren't more of. And that's compounding pharmacists. So compounding pharmacists can make any prescription for you in any form that you need. And one of the things that this fellow that I ran into was, you would come in and he would do a blood test on you and he would tell you exactly what vitamins and supplements you needed. And it wouldn't be a guessing game where you go in and wander through the shelves in a vitamin store and go, well, that looks pretty good. Maybe I should take one of those. <laughs> you know? So this guy would actually tell you, you're deficient on this and this and this. You got too much of this. And here's exactly what you need. He could also do wonderful things like do medicines for kids as popsicles you know, and suckers. <laughs> and things like that where, you know, um, the delivery process was uh, absolutely wonderful. I was also thinking about experiences that would bring people coming back, and one of the things that I like is things like this where new ideas crop up and TEDx experiences, so TED conferences. So if there were a place where every day you knew you could come to hear a new idea, uh, that's the kind of thing that would bring me back. All right, super. Very good. Uh, hand it to this gentleman back over here. Hello. That was a very interesting talk, and I think um, you're seeing in the future. I anticipate more of this happening. And I wonder, if, are you familiar with Jane Jacobs, her book, The Economy of Cities? Some of the things that she predicted 50 years ago that happened today. Um, so one of the things she's talked about in the economy of cities is import replacement, where basically once you start manufacturing in the city the things that are being imported into the city, then you have self-sustaining you know, economic growth. So okay. The things that, what, what do our manufacturers need created in the city instead of being manufactured out of the city? I just think if we're looking, we're talking about public policy could really help this along and understanding um, some of her theories and then getting some funding. Okay. I'm curious. You I'm not familiar with that uh, with uh, that book, but yeah, the. Jane Jacob, she's written a lot. She's a phenomenal thinker. Um, some of the the trends tying into this are the fact that we have. Um, uh, essentially desktop manufacturing systems right now. 
and whether that's 3D printing systems or we have you know, compressed little laser cutters or uh, we have lots of unique tools and devices that put uh, kind of the tools of fabrication that we need right in the hands of most individuals. That, that I find fascinating. And then also the idea of makerspaces coming together. Makerspace is essentially a library for tools. And you can go there and, uh, and just uh, play around with things. And if there's something you can't figure out, it seems like there's somebody close by that you can just ask that question and, and get an answer. Um, that opens the doors for lots of uh, interesting transitions. Uh, other questions right here? Well, I have a question. I, I just thought I'd tell you why I'm here because I want help from you. Uh, I'm a Beaver City Councilman, and we have an opportunity and a problem. First of all, I want to say that uh, we're about 60% sales tax based, so you hit it right on the head when you said that uh, you know taxing is becoming a problem. But here's our opportunity and our problem, and if anybody here is a developer, please come and talk to me. Um, we are the final station on the Gold Line, uh, which is right around uh, Ward Road and 50, 50th Avenue, right by the candy factory where it used to be, if anybody knows that area, Jolly Rancher. Um, it's primarily an industrial area. It's industrial and warehouse. Um, but Dr. Cog and others are very oriented around low-cost housing, and so the area is going to be zoned primarily for, for housing. But it's not really appropriate since the area is, is all industrial. So we're looking for a way to liven up um, what is going to be a what we want to be a destination station that is primarily in an industrial area. So that's why I'm here. Oh, good, good. Yeah, so if you think about the transition we're going to go through in housing, um, it's going to be pretty substantial over the, the coming decades. Uh, as we move into a driverless car era, we suddenly we don't need to have garages anymore because we can step out in front of our house, punch in, we're going to, uh, I want to go to work, I want to go to school, I want to go shopping. A driverless car comes and picks you up, takes you to where you want to go, and from there it takes somebody else to where they want to go, and so on and so on. This becomes on-demand transportation. It transitions us from a just-in-case mindset, I have a car in my garage just in case I need to go somewhere, to a just-in-time mindset, I can summon a vehicle just in time whenever I need it. Depending on how the drone world evolves, I mean, we all have an entire set of tools in our garage just in case we need to fix something. But rather than having those things sitting around, uh, and I, I like the, the comment that the CEO of Airbnb makes. He says that uh, there's 39 million Americans that have an electric drill in their garage that they've used for exactly 17 minutes. Uh, does that mean we all really need an electric drill? So if you need to fix something, if we could suddenly summon a drone to deliver an electric drill to us that we could use uh, for a few minutes and then send it back, then we, we don't have to own all these things. Uh, how does that change our society? How does that change our, our living center? Will it evolve that way? We, we don't quite know for sure, but these are some interesting. This is fun. I think there's opportunity for uh, more guided experiences, guided adventures. Um, you know, you have all these different makers and experiences around. I think you, you could actually, there's the membership opportunities where you can buy a membership and you'll have personalized experiences, kind of make shoes and that sort of thing. So that, I think there'd be a huge opportunity in that. I think people would pay like monthly for something like that, um, especially for the kids. All right, very cool, very cool. Other thoughts, other ideas that you might have? I'll, I'll get you next. I'm just curious, based upon what you just said, is that bringing back the idea of apprenticeships that you know, we've gone away from in the last 150 years somehow? 
that I don't know, I don't know what it is, some type of human need or desire to create with our hands that but we've left that, we've gone into this completely, you know, manufacturing state where everything's made in China, but it's just somehow not satisfying. And now we're leaving that and people are wanting to, to do something again. Just exactly. And I think it will come from entertainment, but then the graduate and maybe apprenticeship, you know, you find someone who really picks it up. So with the, with the Internet of Things, um, we, have, um, we have the ability to track everything that we own. So if we put a little tracker on everything over $100 in value, then you would know where your lawnmower is, where your chainsaw is, where your electric blenders are. You know where everything is at any given time. But more importantly than just that, you would also know uh, you could have a list of, of all the things that you own, and you could constantly look at this. You would, uh, it would, and it could actually be updated. The value of everything could be updated on a daily basis. So if you own rare coins or collectibles, depending on what, what these are trading for online today, then it could update you on the value of everything you own. I think that that would be very revealing because if we, if we suddenly were much more aware of all the crap that we owned, which is way too much crap, <laughs> um, I think it would be, uh, create a lot of anxiety. We'd get rid of it. We'd want to do something with it. <laughs> um, let me go back here to you. Hi. I live in Golden and Golden has uh, put a lot of money in the last 25 years into urban renewal. And our historic downtown is now incredibly charming. And everybody wants to be there now. And um, in the last few months, we've had a coffee roaster, a woman who makes uh, like essential oil-based lotions, um, a gluten-free bakery, and a bunch of businesses that are uh, basically mostly manufacturing businesses, um, they've moved into the downtown area, but the rents are pretty prohibitive in downtown Colton. And um, we have an incredibly charming space that's going to be coming available. We have an old amusement park that's going to close at the end of the year. And so this happened, you know, I, I was noticing those new building, those new businesses opening at the same time I was hearing about the amusement park closing, and I was thinking, what a great place that would be for a maker's space, that the ideas just converged for me, that it would be nice to have a place where we could have more of these craft or arts and kind of businesses and um, have it at lower cost rents and maybe have an incubator kind of situation where you could get reduced rents to begin with to, to help these businesses get off the ground. And I was interested in your idea about acre tenants because we have Five breweries in Golden, and four of them are small. <laughs> <laughs> and any one of them would make a great anchor business. They're all super. We don't know who that other one is, so. That's a good All right, great idea. Great idea. Did you mean heritage? Is it heritage? Okay. okay. Um, other comments, thoughts that we have here? Now, I, I thought this would work very well as, a, as kind of a roundtable discussion because uh, as I was hearing comments coming in here, um, we actually have people from the Western Slope here. Um, we have uh, representatives from a variety of different cities in the metro area here. And, uh, and we all have different interests uh, coming in here. And so I, I map out just kind of this, this core outline of, of some of my original thinking, but I, that's certainly uh, just a starting point. And so, um, yeah, go ahead. Yes, uh, my wife and I, Marianne and I, um, we own a software company that, uh, in fact, I think I talked to you about, about this last time I was here. We were on a software company that sells software for um, people that grow markets. And they use the software to research uh, their organ hybrids and their organ species. Okay. And when people say, well, why should I buy your software? It, it really has to do with meaning. This is why I, I wanted to make a comment. Because when you buy something, 
whether it's a piece of art or whether it's an orchid or whether it's shoes or whatever it is, if that has a meaning to you, it's more valuable to you. So you can go to a store and maybe you'll buy an orchid for, you know, Walmart have some special, it has them right now for 10 bucks. You can go there and buy an orchid. You don't even, don't even know what it is. It's got a label on it. You don't even know what it is. So you buy it, you bring it home. It's pretty, you enjoy it, but you, you know nothing about it. You don't know the species in the background. You don't know the 20 generations of hybrids that it took to get to that orchid. If it's a species, you don't know where it comes from. You don't know anything about it. Yeah. So if you're selling something, you're building something at a maker's district, uh, whatever it is, if it has meaning, uh, you know, it's like going to a museum, and if you're looking, if you're just going to a museum looking at, at things that are hanging on the wall without doing, without having taken, you know, art appreciation classes, it has no meaning to you. Oh, yeah, well, I like that one, I don't like that one, and so on. It has no meaning. Once you understand what actually you're looking at, it has meaning to you, and then you understand the value of it. So that's, that's one comment I wanted to make. The other comment was, and this is a question, I understand that in, you, in the United States, about 7% of the economy, economy is nonprofits. In the Netherlands, I think it's about 15%. It's, it's about twice that. And nonprofits are growing right now as a percentage of our economy. Uh, I wanted to ask you, or you know, ask if anybody has any ideas about how is this going to impact the nonprofit uh, sector of our economy? Is it, is it going to make it grow more, or what, what are your thoughts on that? Hmm. I I'm not sure that, um, I think they're a little bit apples and oranges, but uh, the, the nonprofit world, uh, I mean, one of these makers shops could be set up as a nonprofit business. It could be set up as a for-profit business. Um, it could actually be set up as a combination of two of them um, because uh, you could you could have a nonprofit group running things locally and then sell things through some online website, Etsy or eBay or something, and and have a for-profit uh, uh, addition to the business. So so there's there's various ways of of looking at that. Uh, I'm not sure how this would affect that, but but uh, going back to your other points, the. Uh, uh, every product you buy would come with a story. That's real important because that story has a far-reaching effect. Every product, you, you know kind of how it was developed, how it was made. My wife and I recently bought some artwork at a show down in Denver. The artist was there and we bought this artwork and he proceeded to draw pictures on the back of the artwork and in the end, that ended up being more important to us than the artwork itself. He was telling us stories as he was going along, and so it was absolutely fascinating. So, um, yeah, John? Uh, yeah, I was intrigued by that comment in the announcement that uh, said that uh, it might be easier from a real estate standpoint to fill an empty big box store with Baker District than something yeah. else. Can you comment on that? Or some of that? Um, not being um, a developer myself, I can only uh, kind of imagine my way into this. So uh, the, in my mind, it's, it's all a matter of putting together um, several smaller parties rather than one big party. So rather than attracting somebody that has uh, really deep pockets and has a retail store operation, which tends to be few and far between. There, there are not many options there. The, the, the small mom and pop businesses the, or the people that want to get into that arena, are uh, there's, there's millions of them. There's lots of those people. And lots of them are working in their garages and their basements right now. And, uh, and so attracting the, that type of person would be relatively easy. Now, if, as an example, um, let, me, let me go through kind of a crazy scenario here. If the city decided to set up this maker district as a special taxing district, and they imposed an additional 1% sales tax on all the sales that happened inside of that tax, taxing district, that would, that would uh, give them additional revenue over the long run and they could use seed money then to attract some of the best artists and craftsmen to come in there 
and, uh, and launch their business. So having, let's say, for example, a $50,000 incentive for somebody who's a really good potter or a really good uh, furniture craftsman or dressmaker or whatever, inviting them in and dangling a $50,000 check in front of them, that's pretty compelling. Things can happen quickly then. That's just one kind of scenario. I'm not sure if that's the best arrangement, but that's one possibility. One way I see that this working is perhaps to have a combination of nonprofit and the businesses. And I'm saying that after the gentleman brought up uh, the growth of, of nonprofits. But if we think back to every art district uh, around the whole front range, if you think 20 years ago at the beginning of Lodo, uh, when they just built Coorsville, and Lodo was two years before, it was a bunch of just real crappy warehouses, right? Then it became, over about a five year period, a very strong arts district. Why? Because the rent was free. And people, starving artists, could not quite starve by having them in there. <laughs> well, we all know what happened as soon as the growth came, right? They all get forced out. Um, and the other comments in here was the same type of thing. Is that when, when the area starts working and getting attractive, the rates go up and they lose it. So then they moved down to Santa Fe, uh, Santa Fe, uh, uh, South Santa Fe. And that became the arts district. And now that's still, that's still quite nice, but it's also going through the rough. So once again, you have a displacement of creative people. Now, taking the idea of a maker's district, which I absolutely love because it's a combination of creativity and, and art. Uh, if you're making something out of steel, if you're making a guitar or whatever, to me it, it still really is artistic and it's something that kids can come and they can learn and that kind of thing. If it's a big box store that sat empty for seven years and that either that's owned by um, the Walmart company or the property owner, and they say, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll do something here. Well, deep down, they aren't just thinking out of the goodness of their heart. Uh, once it comes in and starts being successful and people are driving in there and the rates go up, the whole thing's over again. So I'm wondering out loud, would maybe an approach be for a nonprofit organization uh, to say, okay, we will come in and we will buy the property, whatever that is. We will control this and we will set it up. Uh, that entity will be the nonprofit organization. We will set the fees, we will set the rates for this reason. We're not doing it to jack it up a thousand percent in five years. So you have you know the goodness center from that standpoint, then it draws the people in and they will see all the different areas of all the different creators that are going to be in there and the educational programs and, and the entertainment programs and all the things that can make that work. Um, anyway, that's my thought. Anybody? Those models work, not for makers districts, but the, you know, there's community development block grants, there's nonprofits that buy land for, for low income yeah. housing, so that'd be great. Yeah. Kind of the, the, one, the one caveat is, is that if they want to get it accredited, then they have to jump through a bunch of hoops. If they're not worried about the credentialing part of it, then uh, then you can you can just instantly start offering those classes. So, yeah, that would actually be an excellent way to go. Um, yeah, right over here. Just a quick comment, not to bring down the excitement, um, but after spending several months talking with banks and finance and people, I think there's two different pieces here. The anger stores if you want to have financing, are key. Can you find a lot of people that want to try out their business, small business, and grow that way? Absolutely. There's people all over that want to use a commercial kitchen, that want the space to do some of these other projects that you've been showing. But the other piece of it is providing some type of a way for people to build their investment. So long term, we don't want people that just have a place to go rent. We need people to be able to own those businesses and own those spots. And so okay. one of those pieces, there's legislation that needs to happen, and we need to get bankers and, and financers to the point where they can also see what the need of investment here in our communities is, so that we're not just creating products and people have no real investment or no 
feel like what, what's happening in those spaces. Yeah, that, that's a great point. So these could be like condo arrangements? So like condo type business? Yeah, something like that. Or as a mom, it's something like a prospect, but where you can actually own your business. So your mom and pop shop gets to a point where they can actually own that and then they have a piece of, of real estate investment okay. with their business and put up their own home. So All right. I think it's clear this would work in a very affluent community, but do you, do you foresee major spaces working in, in you know, um, struggling areas financially? Yeah, great question. Um, a year and a half ago, when we went, uh, Deb and I went out to Rosewood, uh, West Virginia. It's a very depressed community. They had uh, Main Street, where they had 26 storefronts on Main Street, of which 25 of them were empty. Um, this is uh, uh, one of those, I think the coal mining industry. <laughs> Yeah, well, Walmart, Walmart killed a lot of them, yeah. Um, I, I talked to the, in, the State Farm insurance guy in the community, and he says that, um, that his business uh, could not uh, work with the homes in the area. Uh, he couldn't insure the homes because they weren't up to standard. They, they, couldn't even, they weren't even insurable. So he had to make his business just on car loan, or uh, insuring the automobiles. Um, that, that gives you kind of an idea of, of that type of uh, uh, poverty that's in that area. But there's lots of craftsmen there. There's people that are making things because they have to do something with their time. And a lot of creative people that live there. So having an opportunity to actually create enough of a, uh, a draw uh, it becomes a, an attractor then that attracts people from other communities because enough of them uh, uh, create a critical mass, if you will, and that draws people from long ways away. I find that to be kind of fascinating. Um, can you run? At least, you know, they mentioned some of them, but one of the things that they're doing there is sort of refitting the manufacturing plants. So I I come from Pittsburgh, which is an old paper town in Massachusetts, and they're redoing these old factories into workplaces. You know, and some of this reminds me a little bit of like the idea of a co-op or a kibbutz, almost, yes. where, where people are producing and trading. Yeah. And yeah. Um, so part of uh, what people have been struggling with lately is try to find the right combination of pieces because there's lots of elements that are floating around. And so if you can kind of create the right theme, the right identity for this thing that you're trying to make, it's a new type of development. Uh, it requires the, a new type of developer, not uh, somebody who's just all real estate and finance oriented, um, somebody who's uh, very creative in their approach to these things. Other thoughts, comments? I just wanted to get back to the, to the questions here. Uh, the core ingredient for me is uh, it's the architecture. I'm the guy who looks at the lightning rig and not the performance, but um, it's about, it's an old building that's not meant to be what it is. Yeah. And I guess my question is how do you turn a big box store that has a row of girders on the ceiling that are exactly the same into 100 spaces versus uh, you know, an old shoe store that is now a bakery? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, and that's um, obviously that's going to take some work. Um, we've, we've been using this former bank building here. Um, we have a vault over here. This, the vault works pretty good as a meeting space. Uh, everybody wants to know what's inside the vault because all the bank robbers are trying to get into the vaults. Uh, it's not very impressive in there, it's just a, a box. Um, but the, they'll probably require uh, designers to come in there and rethink the space. It'll probably require maybe some architects. Uh, you need heating and air conditioning that's even throughout the spaces. Um, you're going to need electricity. I mean, some people that are uh, using heavy machines are going to need lots of electricity. Other people won't. Some people are going to need floor drains, and so you're going to have to 
chisel up the floor and put in sewage lines. Um, it's going to, uh, everyone's going to uh, create lots of different problems, but that's where the fun comes in. I mean, you get to, you get to figure it all out. Uh, <laughs> I think it's fun, but I, I love watching people figure things out. So every, every one of these is a credibility building project. I mean, you have to, um, whoever you are that's starting the project, you need to align yourself with lots of people who have more credibility than you. And it's that cumulative credibility, you wrap this around yourself, and then that, that has a lot of influence with, in, with the city council, with the bank, with uh, neighbors, uh, whoever you're, you're dealing with. And so you become the voice of a larger group than just yourself. Any, any last comments, last thoughts? Do we want to hear from our friend from Basalt? In that I have experiences with um, a, a defunct project, real estate project that has a lot of vacant space. And so we inserted what effectively was a farmer's market, but an indoor farmer's market that was wintertime. And we were able to generate a lot of enthusiasm and vibrancy to the area. Um, it was less of a maker's district and more of a farmer's market. Okay. Uh, environment but uh, and now it's been stopped because the project itself uh, moving. So you, you lose these spaces and that can be uh, just a fact of life yeah um, but we've continued to hold on to the vibrancy that it created and it engaged both the small town uh, community but also the tourists in the aspen area in our case and uh, there was no stopping them in terms of pulling out wallets and having no resistance to spending uh, a lot of money on things that are pretty common. But they had stories and they were unique. And it became a bit of a destination after ski day. Uh, so you had people stomping around in their ski boots coming through this area. Um, we now have the project underway, which I oversee. Um, and the downtown district is suffering and has some available real estate uh, building or available spaces that might be ripe for something like this. So uh, I'd like to kind of recreate what we did in the new project, even though it was in a, in a, uh, in a pause at the time, and move that to the downtown area um, and have it be a way to activate that area. So that's kind of what I'm gleaming an awful lot from this, this dialogue. It's been great. All right. All right, super. Um, so some of the questions you'll probably end up asking if you're creating a project like this is, should it be 365 days a year or should it be something that opens up once a month or once every two months? If, you, if you're familiar with the store Tuesday Morning, uh, Tuesday Morning actually has this event selling that they do. So they open up, uh, I don't know, every, every quarter or something like that. And then they send out lots of flyers and uh, get a lot of excitement. They open on a Tuesday morning and people just uh, line up at the door to get in, buy all the bargains. And, uh, and then they're open for, I don't know, for a few weeks and then they close down and they restock for the next one. Uh, that's a very different business model than something that's like a mall that was open every day of the week. Um, there's lots of different ways of, of looking at this. A few years ago, see, I was, I was born and raised in a small town in South Dakota, a uh, little town of Mobridge, and uh, lots of rural America is dying. People can't get jobs there, so they, uh, uh, rural America is exporting people, and the big cities are importing people. And I was, I was thinking it would be real interesting because some of these small towns in rural America are not big enough to support a full-time accountant or a dentist or a chiropractor or a lot of different types of retail shops. And I, th I thought it'd be real interesting to create what I called uh, a docking station. So you could have mobile businesses that would come in and dock with this center. Um, each, each small town then would have a docking center and all of these businesses would dock with it 
and it could be RVs or it could be uh, just people in their cars that get out and set up in there. And it would be a different experience every time you came there because it would be a different mix of people inside of this, this one community center. So that would be, uh, so then rather than just expecting one area to feed your business the whole time, then you could move around and move to where the business is. Having that type of mobile opportunity is kind of interesting. Um, so in something like this, in a maker's district, in some, uh, some formations, it wouldn't necessarily have to have permanent residents. You could have different residents uh, come in and, and book space for a month or for a week and, uh, and set up shop and just do business for a short period of time. Lots of different ways of considering this. So with that, I would like to thank you all for coming here. I'll just make a couple closing announcements here. We have um, Da Vinci Coders is a, a school where we're teaching uh, programming skills to people who want to shift gears in their life. Uh, in our classroom right now, we have game developers in there, and these guys are sharp. These guys are creating new types of games. It's, uh, they're having a lot of fun. Um, so they're actually makers of a different sort. They're, they're making things out of, out of bits and bytes. Um, so our next uh, Ruby on Rails class is starting very soon. It's starting in a week and a half, a week from Monday. Uh, our next game development class is going to start in September. Uh, we have another JavaScript class starting in September. And we have several other things on the drawing board. Um, and if you're, you want to dip your toes in the water, come to our animation workshop. Our animation workshop is going to be a lot of fun. It's full day, uh, and it's uh, uh, pay 20 bucks, you get lunch. Uh, it's, it's, it's going to be real easy. And, uh, with that, I thank you all for coming tonight and hope to see you again next time.